We return to our top story now. Singapore is planning to relax COVID-19 safe management measures as its Omicron wave subsides and with a high vaccination rate among its population. For more on the decision to relax these measures, Weisu talks to Professor Dale Fisher. He is Professor of Medicine at the Yong Lulin School of Medicine and also Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network at WHO. Uh, Professor Fisher, is this a good time to be reopening more? Uh, thanks, Wei Su. Uh, it, it's, it, it is. Um, you remember a few months ago we had uh, about 150 patients in ICU with in ICUs across the country with with COVID. To, uh, yesterday it was just 26, and also, you know, all, all patients hospitalised with with COVID are about half what they were at the beginning of the month. The people requiring oxygen are about half what they were at the beginning of the month. So, so the the, the fear of uh, the, the pressure on hospitals is certainly easing. Um, and we know that the restrictions have got social and economic impacts. So, so we don't want to leave them there in, indefinitely. And, and also other impacts, mental health or uh, affecting business as usual efforts. So, so no, it's a, it's a, it's a good time to, to, to move now. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, two factors that we have been considering. So the stress on the healthcare system and, of course, the cost to our economy and social life when we impose COVID-19 related restrictions. Another thing PM Lee mentioned was that we now have the knowledge and the means to keep people safe. We look back at the months when we've had to decide when to do what. Uh, so this is something, do you think we know enough at this point, given how we can always have new variants to ever say we are really safe? Well, I think everything's always a, a, a risk assessment way, Sue, and, and we, we know uh, a lot about where we are now. We know the, that 99.7% of people that get COVID have got mild or asymptomatic disease. We know that the hospitals are, are, are coping very well now, as opposed to the stress of, of the last few months. So um, we know that there's a very high level of immunity in the, in the population. So, so yeah, we, we, we do know enough. Uh, and and probably we're not going to. It's probably not going to get any better than this. Having good levels of immunity, a, a mild variant, but but uh, uh, of course, you know we, we've learnt as a community how to uh, respond to threats. And and if there is a new variant of concern, perhaps one that that uh, escapes the uh, the immunity brought about by a vaccine or or infection. Uh, then we may be called upon to respond as a community again. And that, that to me, is what being COVID resilient is all about. We don't just say it, it, it's over, forget it. We, we have to have some sort of memory of, of how to respond when we need to respond. But, but hopefully that won't be for a long time. Uh, one of the possible responses already mentioned today is perhaps we might need another booster jab or the administering of an updated vaccine. Uh, we've already heard mention that second booster jabs for vulnerable groups are strongly encouraged but not mandatory. How likely is that to be extended to everyone at some point? Yeah, I was very pleased with this announcement. I, I thought it really showed how... How, how Singapore leadership really applies uh, evidence to to decision making, and and this would be based on on an Israeli study where they looked at about forty thousand infections over sixty year olds, and and actually giving the fourth dose to the sixty and seventy year old groups uh, didn't make much of a difference, but the over eighties group uh, there was a tenfold decline in severe disease. So. So clearly it worked and it was working most effectively in, in those that are most at risk. So, so this was a very good decision. Of course, this only applies to this time frame. Uh, it, it could be possible that in, in, in 12 months, for instance, that it is necessary to apply it to, to, to younger seniors or younger people. But at this stage, uh, the evidence we have is that it's, it's, uh, it's really only particularly effective in the, in the over 80s. Uh, Professor Fisher, uh, the health minister, Mr. Ong Yee Kang, also mentioned the cost to other aspects of our healthcare system, specifically what he called business as usual patients, uh, people with chronic conditions that have not been able to get the kind of care they usually get over the last two years because of COVID-19. How large 
is this problem and uh, what more can be done in the future to structurally address it, as the minister mentioned? Yeah, I must say this is a feature of, of all outbreaks. Um, we, we, we've seen it in H1N1 or Ebola outbreaks or, or whatever, that everything, all the attention gets diverted towards, towards the outbreak for, for necessary reasons. Um, and through through COVID, we've uh, we've seen this really affect other other countries where even even other emergency cases had to be uh, uh, were impacted. But in in Singapore, we have had to um, pull back on some of our routine care. Obviously, routine surgery. Uh, there's a lot of people waiting for their their hip replacements and other operations. Uh, we have to be concerned, has cancer screening fallen behind, of course, mammograms, colonoscopies, things like that, cardiovascular screening, the cholesterol checks, blood pressure checks, even cardiac surgery um, around the world is, has, has decreased. So we've seen TB programs, malaria programs. You can really name uh, all sorts of things around the world that have been affected. So uh, he, he's quite right, and this is part of recovery, is that... Uh, that catch-up or what he called the, the BAU debt. Uh, thanks to that. Professor Dale Fisher, Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network at the WHO.